Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Chapman and York webinar. Um, I'm saying good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because we have a very international session today with speakers from all over the world. Um, today, uh, the topic is Unlock the Secret to Successful Fundraising from Asia. Um, just a few words uh, about me and Chapter in New York first. I'm Arnaud Marcilassi, Head of International Fundraising at Chapter in New York. Chapter in New York has been around for 25 years with nine offices in the world, including uh, the US, the UK, Hong Kong, and Singapore. We have facilitated, and we still do facilitate, uh, $1 billion in cross-borders donation for our clients all over the world. We offer a unique combination of international fundraising and tax deductibles options for philanthropy. Today's topic is how to raise funds from Asia. Um, it's, it's complicated, like uh, most of my, of my clients, uh, when we talk about cross-border fundraising, they, they, they immediately talk about the, the, the United States. And uh, they, they sometimes forget about A Asia and the potential for fundraising in Asia. Uh, we have great speakers to talk about this today. Anna Rotenhecker is our Executive Director of European Foundations and our former Executive Director in Hong Kong, where she lived. Edward Wong is our Executive Director for Hong Kong. Julian Marlin is a Chapel and York fundraising expert. We have 35 Chapel and York experts all over the world, and, and Julian is one of them. He lived and worked for 11 years in Hong Kong. Heather Hill is our head of international philanthropy. Heather managed uh, our foundations and charity management services all over the world. So now I would like to pass the floor to Anna to start the session. Yes, Arno, thank you very much. And I think, yes, uh, my colleague has start, started the presentation. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Um, I have lived six years in Hong Kong, as uh, Arno just said, and I have still a, a very strong interest in fundraising from Asia, although I'm back in Europe now. And my role today is to give you some very dry knowledge on statistics and figures, but nevertheless uh, really important if you would like to understand um, the potential of fundraising in Asia. Uh, to start with, uh, just uh, general um, introductions on reasons why you should actually start international fundraising. Uh, some of you might have already done so, or some of you are just in the reflection process, uh, should you take uh, your fundraising across the border? So there are four main reasons actually why to explore these options or why to do this. Can you just go to the next slide, Lord, please? Thank you. Um, so the first one is uh, that your organization plans to go international, meaning that um, you would like to open either an office somewhere or you would like to set up operations somewhere outside your home country. And uh, obviously you need to um, have uh, the financial means to do so. Uh, you would like to access donations from this given country where you would like to um, start your operations. So it's a good reason to start fundraising in this country. Uh, another option um, why you should go across the border is because you have an opportunity. Imagine you meet a potential donor uh, who is not from your uh, home country, right? Uh, let's say you meet somebody from Hong Kong who is interested in your cause and he would like to support you. So obviously you, do, you don't want to lose this potential donor and the potential donation. So you start uh, your fundraising and relationship building. And if you get the donation, it's an amazing opportunity to work together with this donor to open up the network in this given country and to access more donations from that country. Another reason might be that your existing market is saturated, meaning that uh, you fundraise in your uh, home country. Uh, you don't, uh, you still uh, get in a high amount of donations, but you can't have more donors because whatever you do, you just don't attract a higher number of donors. So that will be a good reason to go across the border and look uh, if there is a potential somewhere else to increase your donor base. And last um, is the estimated high potential of a foreign market. So that depends entirely of your course. Uh, it depends also on your prospective donors. And it depends on the situation uh, the foreign market is in, right? So there are some countries prone 
uh, to uh, donate to uh, typical causes. Others uh, have a high accumulation of wealth. Others have a high interest in cross-border. So depending on how you assess um, a foreign market and the potential, you should uh, go and start your fundraising across the border. For education institutions, and I think there are some of you here who work in the education sector, another reason is actually the intake of foreign students in Europe. Uh, the EU has uh, offered, um, they have published a statistic in 2020, and they said that 25% of foreign students coming to Europe are from Asia. So there's no better reason than to start fundraising with your alumni from Asia under international fundraising. So to give you a few figures and statistics, I have brought with me uh, three reports today. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, just to give you an overview of uh, general Asia cross-border uh, donations compared to the global ones. It's a study of 47 countries around the world. And uh, amongst these 47 countries, they have studied um, five Asian countries, which is Japan, South Korea, China, and India, which you can also see on this nice map, right? And uh, Japan, so they have ranked uh, the countries by their um, amount of cross-border giving. And Japan is actually on rank number four, so very high up. South Korea is on 15, China on 34, and uh, India on 43. So out of 47 countries, India is very low, right? Just a small word on China. Um, the definition of China is quite large. It can be mainland China or China, including Taiwan. China, including Hong Kong, China, including Hong Kong and Taiwan, or only China, or only Hong Kong, right? So we are not quite sure about what they studied um, under uh, this sp sp particular study, but we have seen um, uh, cross-border donations from China in general increase by five times in the last four years. So there's a growing tendency for cross-border donations from China. The next study is from uh, Gift to Asia. Uh, it's quite an interesting study that has been done with uh, 135 nonprofit organizations and 150 donors. They have specifically studied cross-border donations from Asia, and um, they have uh, so they have published a few charts. And this one is about um, where cross-border donations come from, and the majority comes from Hong Kong, right? So it's the first one uh, on the on the slide. Uh, and if I say the majority, it's really more than 50% um, of all donations that, according to the study, um, comes from Hong Kong. Uh, third and four actually are coming from Japan and South Korea again, right? Uh, then we have uh, Singapore on number six and mainland China and India on um, seven and eight and all the others um, uh, on the bottom of the chart. What does it mean? So it does, It for once, it uh, confirms uh, what the um, Global Philanthropy Index had found out, that Japan is a very high potential country for uh, cross-border giving. Hong Kong is a high potential country in South Korea. Singapore, mainland China, and India, they have more restrictions. And uh, this leads me to this topic about what um, is so interesting in international fundraising to uh, know about, and that is the tax and regulations of a given country. So uh, Hong Kong, for instance, has a very variable regulative system for cross-border donations. Every organization who receives donations, uh, even if they operate outside Hong Kong, can offer tax deductibility to their donors. In Japan and in um, South Korea, you have to uh, have a special status, like you have to be a specially, a specially registered organization with international programs to offer this tax deductibility on donations. But it's a very, it's quite a straightforward process, actually. Um, in Singapore, donations uh, have to benefit a majority of Singaporeans and um, donate programs abroad have to be approved uh, on a project basis. It's slightly more complicated, having said that. There are some reforms ongoing, so we hope for the future that it's getting easier. And then when we come down to China and India, um, although we see uh, a growth in philanthropy and also a growth in cross-border philanthropy, the regulatory environment is really complicated. Um, going up to uh, regulations like uh, every uh, donation above a certain amount has to be approved by the government, etc. And very down the list, like if you go to uh, Nepal, for instance, it's just illegal. So this is just to give you an idea, right, about the different regulatory environments that we can have in Asia and why it is so important to know the market 
where you would like to fundraise in. However, for the donor, it is quite um, beneficial to donate to charitable causes. Laura, if you go to the next slide, please. So here we have um, a short a, a table of a few countries which show you the tax deductibility of the nations. And uh, it becomes certainly important if we talk about a certain amount of the nations, right? Uh, for instance, in Hong Kong, if you go to the line of Hong Kong, uh, the uh, all of the donation, 100% of the donation uh, is eligible for tax deduction within the limit of 35% of your taxable income, meaning like 35% of the taxable income of the donor, right? Uh, the donation cannot be higher than this tax deductible income, and then 35% of this is uh, tax deductible. Uh, if we go further down, we see some very impressive um, uh, numbers like 100%, 200%, or even 100% of tax deductible income. So uh, depending again on the donor and on the donation, tax deduction and incentives uh, are very favorable in Asia for donations, both domestically and internationally. These were some very dry figures, I know, but very important to know and to keep into mind if you start your fundraising from Asia. And now I'll hand over to the more exciting stuff from my colleagues who will actually tell you about real fundraising from Asia. Thank you. Yeah, now we move to Hedwood Wong, who's joining us from Hong Kong. It's the evening evening there. Thank you, Edward, for joining the, the session. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I believe most of you are now based in Europe, so I should say good afternoon rather than good evening. All right, uh, as uh, Anna mentioned, I will give you an overview, a general uh, a perspective of some of the issues that you might encounter when you come to Asia for to do, to do your fundraising. Uh, I will cover only the uh, uh, some very generic issues. You know, uh, and I believe uh, the next speaker, uh, Julian, will tell you more about his real life experience because uh, he has so many years of fundraising in Asia. Although I'm based in Hong Kong, I I also have some experience, but. Uh, let me let uh, Julian to share with you more of his experience. Okay, as you can see on this slide, uh, I divide it into the, uh, five categories, cultural issue, legal issue, trust and awareness among your donors, uh, limited resources or expertise among the fundraising organization, that means your organization in Asia, in this part of the world, mm -hmm. as well as alumni engagement and the difficulties of engaging your alumni in Asia. Uh, okay, first, culture. Uh, Asian donor may have a very different motivation, expectation, and preference than European donors. For example, some Asian donors might prefer to give uh, anonymously, uh, while others may seek more recognition and involve in the project they that they support. Some Asian donors may also have different will on the role of the uh, and and autonomous of uh, university and may expect more influence and control over the use of their fund. Also fundraising practice in Asia and Europe different hugely uh, in terms of culture. In Asia, collective some play a significant role in our culture, in our mindset, while uh, Western donors, Western countries tends to be more individualistic. When it comes to fundraising, these cultural differences will make a huge impact on your success in many ways. For example, Asian people make effort to keep confrontation non uh, confrontational while European donors, European people tend to be comparatively, tend to be more straightforward. Additionally, uh, if you have experience coming to Asian country or you already have some experience in fundraising in Asia, you might aware that, for example, greeting in Europe and Asia are different as well. In many contexts, for example, it is considered at, uh, as in, an, inappropriate for men and women who don't know each other well to have any physical contact in Asia. But just for example, shaking hand is fine, but no more than that. 
when it is common for, for for example for French guys they kiss each other on on the face. Okay, this is very basic, but you have to pay attention too. It is important to note that these are general observation and cultural practice can be various within each country, even within the 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 the, the big the great Asian region. Each country or each sub region have their own set of have their sub culture that you have to pay attention to. So to help you to overcome these difficulties or differences, you need to do more research uh, into the country that you are supposed to go to. The next thing is legal and, and regulation barrier. For sure, as Anna mentioned to you, each country, each region have their own set of legal requirement, regulatory requirement related to or governing fundraising, public fundraising. So I, I, I cannot tell you in one word or in one sentence or in one even one paragraph how different it is because it different on a very large scale. But you have to pay attention to do a lot of your research. For example, uh, I received uh, two recent inquiry, uh, one yesterday, one two weeks ago. Uh, they are our members based overseas, not in Hong Kong, not in Asia. They ring me or they email me, ask me whether the fund the regulation, the legal environment uh, governing fundraising, public fundraising in Hong Kong changed because they are aware that, that uh, there are so many uh, changes in Hong Kong over the last few years. So I, I can assure you, purely from the fundraising perspective, there's not much changes. You can still do what you have been doing before, before say, for example, before the pandemic. It's basically the same legal environment in doing public uh, uh, fundraising. Lack of trust and awareness for sure, you are located far away from your donor. If you are not an, an university or institution or organization that they are familiar with, for example, you just uh, do your own prospect research, you identify someone in Hong Kong or somewhere in Asia that they have the capacity to give, they, have, they are interested in your project in some way, how to make friends with them, how to catch their attention. Okay, European university may face challenges in building trust and awareness among the Asian prospects who may not be familiar with their mission. I mean, your mission, your values, your achievement, your, your, your organization, your institution's background. So you may also face competition from other institutions from all over the world. For, for sure, we have our home-based university, home-based institutions. You have to compete with the local one and also other universities, other organizations from any corner in the world. Additionally, some Asian donors may perceive European university as wealthy or prestigious and may question the need or impact of their donation. So you have to think about how to deliver your message I will talk about this. I will talk about, I will provide you some uh, ideas uh, on the next part of my uh, sharing. Okay. And the next thing is limited resources and ex expertise, local expertise, local resources. Fundraising in Asia may require significant resources and expertise from European universities, such as staff, local offices, cultural training, language skills, research capability, alumni network. Okay. However, many universities from European countries may not have su sufficient funding or human resources in allowing them to set up a physical office here in Asia. May it be Hong Kong, Singapore, or any of the, uh, of the city or country that Anna mentioned earlier. Also, even if even if you start thinking about setting up your presence here, physical presence here, 
you may face difficulties in recruiting and re retaining your quality staff from far away from, from your campus. Moreover, based on my observation, some European university may lack of a key strategies or vision for fundraising in Asia. They set up their office here, they recruit some staff, but they don't have a very key vision or long-term commitment, long-term strategies in how they do their fundraising, how they do their alumni uh, engagement thing. So they all these will in turn make your donor, make your pos potential donor uh, difficult to uh, build up the trust or awareness of your project or of your, or your universities. So uh, alumni engagement is the next big thing you have to think about. Some universities are doing relatively very good, very successful in engaging their alumni and employing their alum, uh, alumni as the ambassador to help them to do the groundwork on the ground, to uh, reach out to the prospects locally. Some are less good in this perspective. So once again, you have to think very clearly, have long-term plan, long-term commitment, how you would love to engage your alumni in Asia, in this part of the world. Okay, next page, please. Okay, so I give you a few suggestions. Research the local context and culture. Okay, build trust, long-term relationship, leverage your uh, alumni network and adopt to the change landscape of philanthropy in Asia. Okay, research, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, do your homework, okay? Get to know as much as possible about the country or even the city that you are thinking about to go into to, to raise funds, okay? If you happen to have a, a, a prospect that you are, an a, 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 a A-list prospect that you are going after, check out almost everything related to the local culture. Not necessarily, not only the local culture, for example, he is now in Hong Kong, not only the Hong Kong culture, for example, because he is uh, an immigrant from mainland China, check also his or her motherland's culture as well, because it has a very strong influence on his or her uh, uh, thinking or mindset and, and or his uh, 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 viewpoint on donation. Okay. Build trust and long-term relationship. Okay, trust is a key fact that we all know. I always joke that fundraising is actually friends raising. Without trust, you have no friendship. Okay, so think about how you would, how you could build up this trust. For example, you might organize a cultural exchange program that allow your donor to experience your culture or the value firsthand. Okay, when I thought, uh, when I said exchange program is not about the, the students, but invite your donor, invite your prospect donors, or maybe your, your, your the, the parents of your students to come to visit your campus, get to know more about your organization, your mission, your background, your operation, everything, okay? Also, collaborative research project might be another thing that you might consider if you are a university, not boarding school, okay? You could collaborate with a uh, university in this part of the world, so it helps to build your brand awareness, make your, uh, your, your, your university's name known in this part of the world, okay? And for sure, nowadays, we talk about digital all the time, every day. Think about how to make good use of the digital engagement, not only with your alumni, but with everyone that you are going <laughs> after. Alumni, alumni network, as I, as I said earlier, uh, some universities, some uh, 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 education institution is doing a, a very good job. Think about how to, okay. Uh, Make sure you have a very active, very committed alumni association or alumni organization in Hong Kong. Oh, sorry, not only in Hong Kong, in, in, in this part of the world, in Asia. And make good use of them. 
mobilize them, leverage their resources, leverage their, their, their uh, professional relationship. It helps. It helps you to reach out to your, your, your prospects. And last but not least, add that to the changing landscape of philanthropy in Asia. Okay, because nothing is statics. Okay, donation giving is changing as well. So think about uh, what is going on. Research, once again, research, talk to people, try to figure out the new trend or, or opportunity emerging. For example, there's a growing number of younger, wealthy, and socially conscious individuals in this part of the world. What they are expecting from the organization that received their donation is very much different from the old generation. How they are uh, more willing to be engaged is very much different from the older generation. So think about it, get to know more about this, this or, or this part, and then it will help uh, in uh, increasing the chance of your success. Okay, so this is my part of my, this is the, the part of my sharing and I will leave it to the next speaker to share with you more first-hand experience. Thank you, Edward. Uh, now it's, uh, it's Julian Marlin. Julian is the head of Breakley in the UK. He's also one of our 35 Chapel and York experts in the world. One of my favorite and best experts. Uh, we're actually working together right now for a big U.S. campaign for a UK, for a UK organization. Uh, Julian lived in uh, Hong Kong for 11 years, and uh, I think what he's going to share now will be very interesting to you, Julian. Well, th uh, uh, thanks very much, Arne. Uh, and uh, and uh, good to good to, good to meet everybody here. And uh, thanks also to to Edward, whom I also knew when I my time in uh, in Hong Kong. Um, so just to yeah, just a, just brief a bit on my background. As Arno said, um, I've been uh, I started my fundraising journey actually at the British Museum back in uh, 1994, so nearly 30, 30 years ago. Um, and I've worked uh, both as a fundraiser development director. For a number of organizations uh, in the educational and cultural sectors uh, both in europe and in in asia um uh, in asia specifically i i ran breakley asia from 27 uh, 2007 fact, before i moved out to hong kong uh, uh until, until 2012 um uh, and then i then worked for a big inter a big international school and finally i was working for the west kowloon cultural district for those of you who know uh, hong kong um i uh, as a consultant, I've had clients obviously in Hong Kong, but also in Singapore, Delhi, Beijing, Seoul, Manila. Um, and I also, of course, while I was in Hong Kong, was approached frequently by people, uh, by European and American organizations wanting to raise money in Hong Kong and Asia, generally to ask for advice and so on. So I would say I've got a fair amount of, of on the ground experience in this area. Um, uh, if we could just uh, move to the next slide, please. Um, now, uh, and, Ed, and Edward, absolutely. I, I, I just want to amplify some of the things that Edward sort of said, really. Um, I mean, number one, Asia is enormous. I mean, it's about half the world's population. Uh, it lives in Asia. So, uh, and of course, there is no such thing as Asia. There is There are very many different countries. And the important thing from our perspective as fundraisers is, you know, they have different laws, different charity regulations, different tax systems, or, as well as different languages and cultures. I mean, very different languages and cultures. Um, so to generalize about such a diverse area is really um, almost impossible, but it's but nevertheless, <laughs> that's what that's what we're trying to do here in talking about Asian fundraising. So let me just let me just try and say picking out some of uh, some of the things that Ed, uh, from, it, from picking up on some of the things that Edward said about uh, what 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 is in my experience, what is really uh, it, it, it is different from say fundraising in Europe or in or in North America. Um, and I, I would overlay that by saying, probably not as much as you think. <laughs> All right, I mean, it's, uh, and particularly if you're going to look at what, what I focus on, which is major gift fundraising. Um, but I'll come to that. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that in a bit more detail. Um, first of all, Relationships. Um, if there's one thing that is super important in Asia, it's relationships. 
Um, I think relationships are important everywhere and they generally are, right? I mean, fundraising, with your, I've, since I've been back here in, Asia, in Europe, it, that's very clear here too. But I would say it's even more important um, uh, it, 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 in Asia um, and uh, in, in all Asian countries. Those, those, those personal relationships uh, and how they work is the key to understanding, particularly for major gifts. I would also say, allied to that, um, it, to generalize again, my feeling is that Asian societies uh, place high, slightly higher um, importance on status, on individual status. So in other words, uh, I've had experiences where it was important to understand the, the relative status of individuals. So if we're, if we're going to, if we're, uh, if, we, if we're getting money from a, a an individual who is who runs a big company, then it, and and they they're the chairman. Then it was important that my chairman, the the chairman of the organisation I was working for, was seen to be uh, in the forefront of managing that organisation. I, as a mere functionary, as a fundraiser, would probably not have the right status to do that. Although interestingly, as a Westerner, sometimes you're given a bit of a you don't fit into quite the same the, the same structures so sometimes that can work to your favor sometimes against you but but again understanding how how that works so remember about the status is important i would say again thinking particularly about major donors um understanding it's more important to understand about who they are as an individual than it is about whether you know about their whether they're chinese or japanese or Filipino or whatever, you know, whatever kind of national culture they have. Um, it's always a good idea to understand a bit about local culture. I mean, that's always worthwhile. I wouldn't disagree with that at all. But but I think, off, you know, two Chinese billionaires can be as different from each other um, as they are, uh, you know, and may even be rivals and may even hate each other, frankly, you know, um, th uh, uh, than they are from other people. And particularly with major donors, remember, they're quite often quite global people. Um, and if you're a, a Western organization, a Western university or, or something, chances are the people who are going to be interested are the quite Westernized um, uh, people, people either who, who they themselves have attended a Western university or their children are. So they are more, um, you know, they're, they're more, uh, they're more, they're more, uh, uh, they, they, they might not be, the same as a, a normal Chinese person, if you see what I mean. Uh, so, so I think it's more important is understanding what are they like individually. This is always true for all major giving everywhere in the world, understand the individual, and that's the point of major giving. But I would say, uh, you know, that is, and that is definitely true in Asia too. I think moving on from that point, a point that I sometimes saw when I was there, that Western organizations would kind of want to overcompensate for cultural differences. But by which I mean, they somehow, they thought, oh gosh, Asia, it's very different. I must make sure that I come across as, as very Asian or something. I, I, and um, I'm trying to give some ex specific examples, but, you know, um, uh, trying to, you know, um, uh, you know, ensure that, uh, that, 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 that they were, you know, super respect, uh, respectful, uh, uh, being respectful is always important, but kind of going over the top, trying to pretend to be Asian, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, you know, talking about uh, feng shui, for example. I mean, you know, that, so that was an example I had once. Um, the uh, school I was working at, the headmaster decided it was a good idea that we should have a, have a new project uh, attended by a feng shui master, you know, one of these, uh, the, the Chinese, um, uh, one of these Chinese traditions. And I can assure you that half of our Chinese parents thought this was a terrible idea. They, you know, they were sending their kids to a Western run school. The last thing they expected us to do was do feng shui. Um, and so now some thought it was quite a nice idea, but, you know, it, it, so it was it, our Western parents didn't have a problem with it. But our Chinese parents did because they thought we were we were being inauthentic as a and this is a school in Hong Kong, you know, uh, but it, they thought we were being inauthentic in, in doing that. So. It's one of these things where you have to be a little careful not to try and fake uh, Asian culture. Um, another thing I would say, and Edward and I had a bit of a debate about this when we were preparing for this. In, in my experience, um, Asian alumni are 
extremely proud of having been to their school, or at least a lot of them are, right? Uh, I would say there's a higher level of engagement uh, or, or, or a willingness to be engaged, I should say, with their universities and even their uh, the high schools if they attended a, a boarding school, uh, say, uh, than you would find amongst uh, European uh, Europeans. Uh, I would say it's on a par with America, right? I mean, it, it, uh, alumni engagement is generally much higher in America than it is in Europe. I would say Asia is up there, with, is more American style in the in its level of uh, of people being expecting to be engaged. And so, I think particularly for European universities, I would say be aware of that because uh, remember your your European your 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 Asian alumni are going to be uh, their peers who are sort of sim at similar professional level in, in Asia, um, will be people who probably went to US universities, who will be getting probably a much higher level of alignment engagement than they're getting as alumni of European universities. And they're going to say, well, does my university care about me? You know, I mean, so I do think that you need to think about uh, th that context, that in, that in, a in Asia, you know, people are forever boasting about which university they went to and they, they want their university to to do well, to so that so that they have higher status because of where they went. I, I honestly, that it's more of a thing in Asia. When I when I went, I had never dreamed of putting my the fact uh, that I was a graduate of Oxford on my business card until I went to Asia. Right, <laughs> I never did that in London. But when I went to when I went to when I went to uh, when I went to Asia, I said I'm actually putting M A Ox on after my name. Yeah, that was useful, right? <laughs> uh, so that's just an ex uh, silly example, maybe, but it's a sort of what I mean. This is important in Asia. So now the practical question, uh, just my final point on this, the practical question is how do you service that in a practical way? Um, so if you've got a lot of alumni in Asia, uh, a, a number of universities do set up these representative offices. Um, most. I think the majority of them are, are in Hong Kong. I think some probably are in Singapore. Um, it, the, the, uh, and it's, it can be tricky, though. It's, uh, number one, it's very difficult to manage, right? You've got a person, a, an executive director of this office, sitting thousands of miles from, from the mothership. How do you manage them? Also, there's often unrealistic expectations. Uh, I mean, a good friend of mine uh, used to run, I think still runs, the, the Oxford and China office. Now, for Oxford, it, it probably made sense, had lots of alumni, had lots of donors as well in Asia. But he often <laughs> said to me, one of his problems was that um, uh, the, uh, the, the um, uh, people in Oxford expected him to know absolutely everything about what was going on in the whole of China, which was not realistic. And meanwhile, everyone in, in um, all alumni, uh, it, you know, in China expected him to know everything that was going on in Oxford University, which again was even more complicated. So, so you know, it, you sometimes as as a problem of expectation, how you manage that. But it's something to think about. One thing uh, that, um, and obviously to link it back to what we're talking about here with Chapel and York, is that obviously Chapel and York can provide you with the, um, with if you like, the, 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 the basic infrastructure to accept donations in Hong Kong and, and Singapore, um, which are sort of two of the main hubs for, for this. So uh, that that saves you the, 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 the hassle of actually creating the legal uh, legal structures. Um, because those that's always comes with certain cost and and uh, and hassle. So, uh, but it, and then you can then just focus on how are you actually going to service your alumni uh, if you have large numbers of alumni. What how is it worth? And and crucially, uh, pursue uh, potential donors um, there. And again, lots of practical questions about how many times do you do you get your vice chancellor or, or and other senior people to come out there. Um, just keeping track of which professors are visiting is a challenge. <laughs> um, you know, if you're a uni big university, uh, as a, if you're in the development department of a big university, really tough to get that sorted. Um, I saw lots of lots of lots of missed opportunities where where that where that happens. So those are just some of my thoughts um, about it. Just to summarise, uh, there there is a lot of money in Asia these days. There is philanthropy going on. Um, but the crucial thing is, have you got a legitimate relationship that you can you can build on, um, and be authentic to yourself. Don't try and don't try and fake it. Try and be who you are, um, and find out who cares about you, and work those those particular relationships. Um, and don't do anything too dramatically different from, from what you would be doing in good relationship managed 
month uh, relationship fundraising elsewhere. I think that's uh, that's all I well, that, that's that's it for me. Thank you, Thank you Julian. Uh, like Julian just said, uh, we have uh, foundations in uh, in seven countries all over the world, including Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, we call we call this uh, this foundation our family, our global family of foundation. A fund with our foundation is a way to offer tax benefits to donors in a country without having to set up a separate legal entity. The foundation handles all the legal, regulatory, banking, and gifts processing work, reducing the burden for the foreign charity. We also offer charity management services locally in each country. Uh, Heather Hill, our head of international philanthropy, is the specialist on these topics. And uh, hi, Heather, uh, it's over to you now. Great. Thank you, Arno. If we could advance this slide, that would be lovely. <laughs> so as, as everyone, my colleagues have already mentioned in this webinar, one of the main things you need to just keep in mind anytime we're doing cross-border fundraising, um, and the same was true for Asia, just be aware of the regulatory challenges as well as the opportunities. Um, different countries have different rules about what types of donations qualify for tax benefits, uh, as well as regulations around being able to move funds across borders. So just be very mindful of that. Do your research before you start doing your fundraising, um, lest you find yourself uh, being assessed penalties or your donors being unable to realize tax benefits for their support of your work. Um, so knowing the regulatory challenges is great. Knowing the opportunities and um, where donors might really be eager to take advantage of tax benefits or other uh, regulatory rules that work in their favor um, and you know, creating giving opportunities that align with those is important as well. So it's not just the what can't you do, but it's also about knowing what you can do and what donors would be quite keen to engage with you on doing. So in navigating some of the, the regulations, um, there are a few solutions that are available to you. Um, you can ask a like-minded organization to help. So if you have a partner organization, a sister organization, um, sometimes they're sister schools, if you're talking about education, um, but finding one of those registered charities in country who you can work with um, or a donor could give to them and they could find a way to then um, grant the money to you. It gets a little bit sticky um, depending on how they're registered and what their registered purpose is as far as whether they'll be able to uh, move that money across borders to you. So it is very important that you do solid research uh, and look at all the different um angles in which your relationship might be viewed to ensure whatever you do with that like-minded organization is all going to be viewed favorably by the local government. Um, so it does take a little bit more thought and planning if you're working with a like-minded organization and not an organization that specializes in this. Alternately, you can work with an intermediary. And as Arno was just sharing and, and Julian mentioned as well, um, Chaplain York has a global family of foundations. Those foundations are essentially intermediaries. They are registered charities in the countries where they're located. Donors can give to a fund with the foundation and receive a tax benefit. The foundation handles all the regulatory, compliance, legal, banking, um, donation processing, all that administrative work um, for you. Uh, and then the foundation is able to, upon uh, foundation board approval, make grants out from those funds to the fund holders. Um, the fund holders being the charities who are doing the cross-border work. So an intermediary is a, is a solution that, again, minimizes the burden for you. You also have the assurance that you're working with a partner who is experienced and knowledgeable about the regulations in the country where you're trying to do your fundraising and already has vehicles in place for being able to ensure that you are the end recipient of the funds that are raised. Um, in addition to Chapel in York, there are other organizations that do this. I don't want to, to see like we're only plugging ourselves. There are a number of solutions out there. 
Um, but again, an, an intermediary is a good option um, if you don't want to um, and have the administrative burden uh, of setting up something yourself in country. Although that is also a solution, you can set up your own separate legal entity in the country in which you want to fundraise. Obviously, that's a much more complex process. It's something I'd really only advise if you're planning on being in country for an extended period of time, if you know you will have a continuous donor base there in which you can engage and um, secure support from for a short-term campaign. I wouldn't recommend setting up an entity, but uh, for universities, for example, if you know you have a strong alumni base in a particular country, it might make sense. So maybe you do want to set up a Section 88 charity in Hong Kong, or maybe you do want to register somewhere. Again, it's really dependent upon what are your long-term goals for cross-border fundraising from that particular country. So if you're establishing an entity that might be a, you know, a Friends of X type organization, you could also have it um, be something different as well. But that means that you need to know, um, if you're setting up yourself, you need to know all the legal and regulatory information. You've got to do all the filings. You've got um, to set up banking, donation processing, and have all those pieces in place. And then also be aware of how you can um, take use the funds that have been received by your separate legal entity and get those over to um, your uh, home charity, essentially. So there are also options for having that entity set up and managed by someone other than yourself. Um, ultimately, you are the, the primary stakeholder in it, but taking the administrative burden off. Um, and as Arno mentioned, uh, Chapel New York also does charity setup and management. Um, so we can do the just the setup piece or just the management piece, or if you want the continuum of service, we can do both. Um, but again, that's a way to have that long-term presence and alleviate the administrative burden. Obviously, having your having your own entity, maintaining that um, for multiple years, is a bit more of a commitment and expense than um, working with an intermediary or working with a like-minded organization. But if you are truly investing in your um, your donors who are in that country and establishing long-term relationships with them, as well as the donors who come after, it is an option to consider and it can be done um, without it having to be overly taxing on you as the charity or organization. So that's a little bit of a summary on how you can transfer donations uh, cross-border in a tax-effective way for your donors, uh, as well as making sure you have an efficient process for yourself. With that, I would hand it back to Arno. I think we have a little bit of time for Q&A. Thank you very much, Heather. Yeah, um, we will take questions now. Um, so do, do, do you have questions? I might start with one question to, to Julian. Uh, Julian, um, in your experience in the higher education sector, um, what's your experience of knowledge or knowledge of Asian alumni giving to their overseas alma mater? Essentially, I think US universities, UK universities. Uh, well, generally it's very, I mean, it's very strong. I mean, uh, I, you know, uh, I, I personally didn't work for a, a university while I was there, but I, I did, I did do some consulting work and I did, um, I, did certainly, I mean, I, I knew lots of my, my, my friends and colleagues were, uh, you know, I what used to be coming, I used to have dinners every week with friends who were coming out to Hong Kong to do fundraising. So there's a lot of, I mean, uh, Hong Kong in particular, I would say, there were a lot of people coming out to Hong Kong. Uh, a lot of vice chancellors come out a, 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 from time to time. So I would say that, uh, uh, and they, they do that because it's worth it, right? They do that because they raise a lot of money there. So um, so I would say, but it also means that if you don't do it, um, you know, you 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 know, if you don't, you don't travel, uh, if you don't physically show up from time to time, then you, it's going to be harder harder to raise money. So uh, in terms of willingness, absolutely, as I was saying, particularly alumni, or, and often parents of students or parents of alumni as well. So sort of the wider, remember, one thing I didn't really mention is the importance of family generally in Asia. So in other words, often it's a family decision uh, to do these things. 
so yeah, I, I would say definitely if you're not if you're not if you have a lot of Asian alumni, as a lot of European universities do these days, you need to have a, a, a plan for that engagement and research and who are they and who are my wealthy, who are my wealthy uh, 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 the wealthy people, and I would say in this context to give them a bit of a bit of a plug. That the best source of information for for very wealthy Asians, uh, I I would say use um, uh, what Wealthex now now known as Altrata, whom um, obviously we at Chapel and York have a partnership with. I would say they have very good coverage in Asia. So if you don't know enough about uh, your your Asian alumni, use use some services like that to uh, to find out more. I would I would also jump in on that, Arno, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Working in higher education in America. Um, the university has both had alumni chapters um, in some Asian countries. And I will say what worked very effectively and might be something to consider is engaging your alumni who are more active with you, who are on the ground as hosts. So then as just as Julie was saying earlier um, and Edward as well, building that trust and building the relationship when you've got someone in country um, who's a graduate who is not working for you, but this is doing this as a volunteer who's offering to host, who's facilitating these conversations. I think that that can be very meaningful as well. Um, but again, having kind of these chapter gatherings where it's not just a fundraising event, but they have the opportunity to hear from the university um, and connect with other peers who uh, are alumni as well can be a nice uh, cultivation activity. So if you've got, if you know you have a, a good um, number of people in a certain region to be able to bring them together every so often, um, those are really great opportunities, again, to build the trust and build a relationship um, and have a nice cultivation program especially if you can leverage local um, hosts and advocates for you. Thank you, Yeah. Really agree. yeah. Uh, any questions from uh, attendees? Can I uh, I'm seeing a question from Graham Papenfus. I have an Asia Pacific Advisory Board helping me connect and fundraise locally and host, host my visits. Uh, it's not really a question. You Can want... I actually ask a question? Yeah, 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 sure. Thanks. Uh, I, I'm actually really curious because, um, you know, back in Europe now, I figured how often we discuss this difference of, uh, you know, younger people fundraising, generation set fundraising, uh, how uh, to work with the younger peoples and from my time in Asia I know how important it is and what Edward also said that when you talk about a donor or to a donor or to a student or a young person you also talk to their parents you know because very often it's the parents who have the wealth and it's the parents who take the decisions and now Edward you said that there are more and more young middle class and higher you know net birth young people raising and they have other interests so is there any advice that you can give on this difference when you fundraise in Asia about who to talk to, you know, I mean, is there a change now that you talk less to the parents or less uh, more to the alumni, for instance, or is there a different way of interacting with these young people? Uh, it depends. Sorry. If we are talking, if we are talking about uh, universities, I think uh, it's more important to talk to the alumni first. Uh, because mm -hmm. they are young adults or already adults. So uh, you should always talk to or engage your alumni first. And But if your institution is a, a boarding school or, or other type of education institutions, then maybe you have to engage more of the, the students' parents or alumni's parents because they are the one who support the, the children to study at your, your, your college or your institution. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what type of education institution that you are, you are, you are working for. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, okay. Yeah, Julia, if you want to add. Well, no, I was just going to say, I largely agree with that. Um, and I, uh, I, I, obviously difference, very much a difference. Uh, I, I think it took, I think you, you, your alumni are your alumni first, but you need to be aware of, the, you know, the 
the the, the importance of the of the family wealth. So again, understanding how that that person sits within the family hierarchy, I I, I would just say as a general point, uh, family is probably more important in Asia than in Europe. So in other words, you'll and and and, and kids are more generally the younger people are more deferential towards their elders than is the case in Europe or, or North America as a massive generalization. But that I've, I, that is, that is something that I've certainly observed. Um, so, so that they're, they're more likely to listen to uh, their parents and their, and fit, fit in with their parents, parents' wishes. Uh, you know, so that, that would be something I would, uh, even though they may now be in their thirties or forties, right. They're still, you know, they'll still, uh, they'll still, uh, and that may be a practical matter. It may well be that the, 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 the father still essentially controls most of the family money at that stage. So again, each, each situation is going to be different. Uh, it depends how the person is, has the person made the money themselves, which is often the case with young people, young professionals in, in Hong Kong and elsewhere do pretty well, or is it inherited family money? Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, we're we're getting close to the hour, so we're gonna we're gonna close this. Um, um, I hope uh, this webinar was useful to you. Um, please get in touch with Heather or myself if you need help to fundraise in Asia. We're here to help you and answer your questions. Thank you very much. And um, I hope uh, we'll see you at our next webinar because we're doing webinars very often. Uh, thank you very much for participating. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Au revoir. Bye-bye. Au revoir.